in transition economies, China, Russia, South Africa, and the business Mediterranean style, and global Greece, and Portugal. She's also the director of the Rolling Stones program, and the director of Rolling Business Learning Community. Internationally, uh, Dr. White has lectured at the Roman Brown Institute in South Carolina and the University of Pennsylvania of Bonn. She is the recipient of several teaching awards, including the overall state teacher in Georgia State University, and other awards uh, uh, to international educational excellence awards, and uh, well, too many awards to read <laughs> all of them, in addition okay. to striving for excellence and innovation in the practice. Many of your contributions to the scholarship of teaching stem from your collaboration with Duke Cyber, which have resulted in the publication of several cross-cultural negotiation simulations, the implementation of the algorithm in China, simulation in Singapore, detailed in two or four special issues of global business languages, and more recently to our role in the I as the ICE teaching consortium advisors. Dissemination of culture after pioneer by Richard Lewis and IC initiation. We're all both cross cultural investors, tools grounded in uh, LMR. Other research interests include strategy, structure, performance, linkages. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. And what I want to talk to you about today is what I consider to be the intersection of ethos, pathos, logos with a relatively new area for our conference, and that is innovation and entrepreneurship. So uh, I, I really wanted to challenge myself to think about how these terms come together, and, and that's really what my presentation is about today. So what I'm going to explore with you is this intersection of ethos, pathos, logos with the new themes of innovation and entrepreneurship. If we think about some of Drucker's writings, entrepreneurial management or new technology, entrepreneurship and innovation are systematically related through cause and effect. So that one is the cause, the other is the effect. But this relationship is reciprocal. So innovation can drive entrepreneurship, and entrepreneurship can drive innovation. <clears throat> so here's my little model that, that depicts the relationship between the two and the reciprocal relationship. Um, and I think that this is well established in the literature. Now, if we think about ethos, pathos, and logos, ethos deals with character, credibility, pathos is all about emotion, and logos is logic, as you might expect. So with these three elements of persuasion, these really foster what I consider to be a very powerful platform for the cause and effect relationship between innovation and entrepreneurship. So innovation can be thought of as the tool for entre entrepreneurship, and vice versa, entrepreneurship is the tool for innovation. Now, ethos, pathos, and logos provide a rich milieu for these catalysts to help create the inimitable. And when I say inimitable, I'm really talking about competitive advantage, because that's what competitive advantage is all about, is creating something that no one else can imitate. We're doing it better than anyone else. So thinking back briefly to the origin of these three terms, ethos, pathos, and logos, really began over 2,000 years ago with our great philosopher Aristotle. And it was all about pers persuasion where he argued that persuasion itself consists of these three elements, ethos, pathos, and logos. So let me briefly go through these. Ethos is Greek for character. 
the ethical appeal is that persuasion emanates from the credibility, the authority, or the reputation of the speaker or the writer. So an ethos principled argument is characterized by an appeal based on ethics or credibility. Okay, so this is one component of persuasion. The second component is pathos, which is Greek for experience or suffering. The emotional appeal here is that persuasion is grounded in sympathy, emotion, or instinct. So a pathetic story conveys emotion and imagination so that the audience is empathetic with the values and the beliefs of the speaker or the writer. Okay, so that's component number two. Third component, logos, which means word in Greek. The logical appeal here, persuasion rests with the reason and refers to an argument's logical appeal. Here the importance is the internal consistency of an argument and whatever the supporting evidence is. So basically, if A, then B. That's the logic of it. Now, what I'm gonna say next is that persuasion itself is innovation and entrepreneurship. What is persuasion if not the exploitation of an opportunity? The commercialization of a product or service bringing something new into use. And that definition of bringing something new into use comes from uh, one of the strategy texts that we teach from, and that is the Hit Ireland Hoskisson strategy textbook. But this is what innovation is, bringing something new into use. And really, if you think about it, that's what persuasion is. So by previously establishing the cause and effect relationship, uh, persuasion is then also entrepreneurship. So if ethos, pathos, logos mean persuasion according to Aristotle, then these constituents are then linked to innovation and entrepreneurship in this model here. Okay, so remember earlier it was entrepreneurship and innovation, reciprocal relationship. And now what I'm saying is persuasion impacts both of these. So we have persuasion in terms of the ethos, pathos, and logos on either side, on the innovation and the entrepreneurship side, because we're talking about persuasion. Okay? Now, I want to talk a little bit about this notion of creative destruction. And to me, you can't really talk about entrepreneurship without mentioning Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, and his notion of creative destruction. I mean, that's really what entrepreneurship is all about. So here, the idea is that you must destroy the existing technology, product, service, whatever, in order to make way for the new, to replace the old with the new. If you think about it, we have creative destruction in all aspects of our lives. When we got digital cameras, we had to do away with 35 millimeter cameras. That was creative destruction. When DVDs came along, we had to do away with VCRs. All kinds of aspects of our lives, you see this creative destruction. We see it in life, birth of new babies, the death of older people. <clears throat> so we're always, always replacing the old with the new. And in a sense, this is really similar to the natural economic selection, where survival of the fittest is dictated by the market, or survival of the fittest in life is dictated by those who are physically fit. <clears throat> so, value chain idea of ethos, pathos, and logos. Remember, value chain means that each activity is adding value. Of course, there's a cost, but there's also a value. So this is really the function, the pivotal function that connects the dots 
And I always think back to Steve Jobs' commencement speech that he made in 2005, 10 years ago at Stanford, where he talked about connecting the dots. And if you've never listened to his commencement speech, I highly recommend that you do. In his speech, he discusses three stories. Um, one of the stories that he talks about is when he was at Reed College, he dropped in on a calligraphy class. At that time, they had one of the best calligra calligraphy classes, he says, in the US. And he learned all about serif and sans serif typespacing. Now, none of that made any sense when he was taking those courses, but it all made perfect sense 10 years later when he and Wozniak designed the Macintosh, where they invented it with beautiful typography, multiple typefaces, and proportionally spaced fonts. And of course, Steve Jobs says that since Windows just copied the Mac, <coughs> no personal computer would have such per beautiful typography if he, Steve Jobs, had not dropped in on that calligraphy class. <clears throat> so this is his story about why connecting the dots makes sense. But you can't connect them going forward. He says you can only connect them going backwards. And that's how they make sense. <clears throat> have you have you listened to his speech? Have you? Yes. But you're talking about the speech at the convention? Yes, exactly. It's, it's very inspirational. Is it on YouTube? Yeah. Yes, you have. Great, great. And seriously, those of you who haven't, you must. So again, his point is that you can only connect the dots looking backwards. So for this plenary session, I want to share with you a video that I think really demonstrates this intersection of ethos, pathos, and logos with innovation and entrepreneurship. Now remember, we're talking about ethos, pathos, and logos as persuasion. Okay, so this is really the intersection of persuasion with innovation and entrepreneurship. And this is just one example of many. so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. I guess I would like a little reaction in terms of what you think. Do you see? my point about trying to bring together persuasion and really any any 
good marketing strategy because if you think about it, persuasion is marketing. Right, right. Good that you saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Appealing to the cost. Yeah. <laughs> you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. There's the logic. Exactly. Thank you very much, Jeremy. <laughs> yes. Right. And it was the product is not nothing. I mean, the product everybody has right, right. for the last right. uh, thousand years. I don't know. I don't know. But it, it, it he, he made it. As a, I think it was great. Exactly. So, and you see the three elements. You see the logos, the pathos, and the ethos, right? Where, where's the emotion? Yeah, I was gonna ask that. Okay. Where do you think the emotion is? No, it's slam the what is it? Machete? Where it's the thing? Down the table, toss it over the bear or wherever it was. That's not a pollution. My idea is not ethos. Uh-huh. It'd be, and I've long thought that the greatest human invention of all time is the new cut. Because I find advertisements like that very irritating. Yeah, they are. They're just annoying. So I can do them. What I would like to do is mute the video. Billionaire at um, youngest age, so that I think about. 
it, it was Sarah Blakely with Spanx, but just recently somebody surpassed her. The biologist, was it at home, I think? Somebody, somebody talk? We're talking about um, who, yeah, which female became the youngest billionaire. Is this, is this woman from, from Body Shop? Body shop uh, yeah, she, Spanx. Yeah. Yeah, she was yeah. the one for, for many, many years. Okay. Uh, her name's Sarah Blakely. But she was just surpassed recently by someone, another female, who became a billionaire at an even younger age. On what page? What age? Mm -hmm. um, she's maybe in her late 20s. The Spanx lady? No, the, the, the one other one, the biologist. Uh, I think her name is Elizabeth Holmes. Twenty Nothing. something. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. You can Google her, but yeah. she just she invented something with a uh, new way to um, detect DNA from just a really small amount of blood, just a drop of blood or something. You can have all kinds of tests. So it's it's phenomenal. But I get them talking about that, and it's just. Uh, as you can tell, I tend to have a more interactive type of presentation style, so that's why I kept it short so we could talk about it. Did, am I answering your question? Uh, you're telling us how you use this, but how does this correspond to you say that the best type of um, working is, is when you go in here and you don't look holistic? This person looks like a little bit of holistic, mm -hmm. but I've got the other three categories. Um, does this tie in with what the previous? So are you just thinking about the linear active, multi-active, reactive yeah. model? Yeah. Um, I mean, linear is just one piece of that. You know, there's other pieces where you have multi-active and reactive. So linear is linear for that, or? Right. There's a correlation between people who are in business and who think in a linear uh, fashion. I think that's what you're thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, so, but it doesn't mean it's the best. We need other people in the world besides just business people. <laughs> but what you say the least, Jeremy says. Yeah, is there something going on here though, which is kind of odd with you, right? Is that you 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 lean back into the I call it the competitiveness, the survival of the fitness, the necessary and stuff, and like this, that kind of environment. Now it seems like an ad like this, you know, assuming a life of its own. I'm going back to Ben Pack, I'm going to the older days. But uh, in the older days we talk about the waste management and creating superfluous variety. You know, we're talking about products having the uh, uh, newer products well, well, replacing them. That is necessarily the case. That kind of implies necessarily the case that the new ones, newer ones, are coming on DVDs, finding the success and stuff like this. You're talking about the creative destruction. Yeah, uh, there we go. And uh, I was a different creation of products that don't last. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it's it planned obsolescence, the waste makers, the purpose variety. That's what in the, in, in, the, in the destructive competitive environment. This is what I have problems with. I, I just see it kind of like ethics, a lot of ethics of the environment, a lot of ethics for cheap labor, uh, production for productive production safety, the production based economy, which I, I would argue is not sustainable in the long run, on and on and on as a sidebar. But I, I have problems with that. Mm-hmm. 
but the, what I understood from her is not that. I mean, many times innovation has a destructive uh, uh, effect. But this is, has to do nothing with with ethics because if I'm having an innovation, something new that is a substitute of the old, I don't see any ethical problem there. This is a natural thing. A different thing if I destroy something just to get more money in my pocket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I understand, you see. But I think she was referring to something natural. Let's take a look at the energy industry. Fracking, supplanting the extraction of oil from the ground. What fracking is doing to the environment of Canada and places like that. But this is and I, I'm saying these, these, what we think is, is innovation. You talk about innovation being something that's survivable in an environment. That's a more generic uh, innovation, as I see it. And so, how does something survive? And how does something survive? The like Vance Packard and the advertising and stuff like that it has kind of like an artificial life that's different work. It doesn't it, if it had if it really had to stand on its own without the aid of the advertising and taking advantage. This is psychological warfare. See, most of what we're seeing out there in advertising is nothing <coughs> sort of psychological warfare. Taking advantage of ignorance, taking advantage of lack of critical thinking, taking advantage of lack of the intellectual and philosophy and things like that. In the advertisement out there, it's trying to do one thing convince people to buy something they may or may not want, want or eat. And I see this thing assuming life of itself. So that would be, that would satisfy the requirements of being innovative, something that survives in the environment. Now, but what kind of environment? Again, is the lack of critical thinking is not the business of the innovator. This is a business of high, uh, uh, of education, yeah. higher education, or the school, or government, it's or, it's or, it's or it's the parents of the, of the person, but this is not the problem of the innovator. Critical thinking is, a, it is an ethical responsibility if something purveying a, 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 a invention or you know, whatever device or whatever. It is not the business it, of the it is ethical ethical response, It's an ethical responsibility of an advertiser to, 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 to purvey the stuff in a critically thoughtful environment. It's not, it's yeah. unethical to, to advertise, purvey something like this, to convince somebody, convince somebody to buy it. I could be the huckster, I could be the trickster, the circus barker, or wherever it is. That is plainly unethical to do that. I mean, that's, that's, that's not what she's... That's not what she's saying. Mm, I think it's implied. No, it's not implied. I mean... We're, we're looking at different parts of the process. Let's take smoking. Okay, now, there we go. Europeans <laughs> came over, they found the Indian smoking, they thought it was a great idea. They and then they discover it off, causes cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, then you have a dilemma. Okay. Do you want to keep advertising smoking, particularly the young children, or do you want to say causes cancer and so forth? And there was a big battle between the tobacco industry and the mm -hmm. government. So later, as things become apparent, you might have government regulations that limit smoking. Uh, that that just, yes, you're right, but what did that got to do with uh, innovation and entrepreneurship? <laughs> the way cigarettes evolve, they're, they're going to change the character of the cigarette, they're going to do something to dress it up or do something else. Those are called innovations to make the bloody thing not. No, 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 as soon as I know that there is some bad consequences, and I continue doing that, I have an ethical problem. Okay, that's but, if I, but when I am innovating, I have no idea about the consequences. Not necessarily. The, 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 these cigarette manufacturers, they were innovative, they were innovating, and they knew damn well the very basic They didn't that know they that right at the beginning. They didn't know that yes, they did. at the beginning. They, they didn't know that at the beginning. They didn't know that at the beginning. The cancer problem came after no, the people was not. started I remember, I remember the medical man goes back in 1900. They knew that cancer was caused by these bloody cigarettes. They knew this stuff for over 100 years. That's, 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 that's not smart. It's not ethical. 
No, I, I really don't see, I don't, I really don't see why, why the innovator got an ethical problem. I still don't see it. Because if any innovator, if any innovator has an ethical problem, that we should shall down all the innovation in our society. No, I'm not saying that because, you know, the innovator who knows good and well, they may be innovative, like the cigarette manual is a good example, they are improving, they want their I the basic idea to last. So these are cigarette manufacturers. Is this a good or bad innovation? No, that's not the example. No, no, no. <laughs> Answer me, this is good or bad innovation? Yes and no. There is a lot more and more and more people saying that this is a bad innovation. But when it was created, it was not bad. 2.4 gigahertz in the cell, and in the brain cells, I don't know what's a good idea. And they, I, I, I can point to research saying that 2.4 gigahertz causes uh, changes in the cellular structure in the brain. But then we have to stop to innovate. So we're going to innovate even more. But you have one. I know it. <laughs> and I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it. I'm going to use it. It's good in many ways. But, you know, 2.4 gigahertz, all right, I probably, and they need it. So you've right. obviously done the cost-benefit, and you get to say... I don't give a damn about cost-benefit. I want to know whether... I am, a, if I am buying that because I am lack of critical thinking, this is not the business of the innovator. This is the business is of the university is that ethical, innovated me. It's an ethical, it's an ethical responsibility of the innovator to be aware of the issues involved in things like this. How can I know that's what's that's the issues involved with that if, if I get, do, if, do the if, it is, if it is a consequence I'm finding out 20 years later? No, no, I, no, no, not the, this current research. You, you're, so you're responsible to look at the current research. It's not part of the current research. I'm done. Yes, you want to say something, go ahead. No, no, okay. No, really? Esther, you want to say something? Only one name is in this. Vivaldi, we have our innovation. That's a medicine. If you want to make a, a new medicine, an innovation, so you don't have, you mustn't uh, stop the formal uh, product. You have to, to test the new product on some people who are ready to do it.